Hi to everyone. Um, so my name is Natasha and I'm the Fish Policy and Research Manager um, at Compassion in World Farming. So today I'm going to talk about our current Scottish salmon campaign, um, including some of the findings from our recent investigation and our report that we launched last month. Um, and I'll explain why we believe that the salmon industry in Scotland should not be allowed to expand any further um, due to the huge cost to animal welfare and the environment. So first of all, I'd like to introduce Compassion for those um, who are unfamiliar with our work. So the organisation was founded in 1967 um, by a dairy farmer called Peter Roberts. Um, so he founded the organisation after seeing the rise of industrialised methods to farm animals. So these methods involve moving animals off the land and generally just packing them into uh, huge factories with no access to grazing or sunlight or in overcrowded feed feedlots. Um, and basically we're systems where they're denied anything close to a natural life um, and, they, and they're fed on um, grain such as soya. So over the past 50 years or so, Compassion has grown. We've um, been campaigning and lobbying um, to improve the lives of farmed animals around the world. So these are just uh, some of the office, the location of some of our offices. <clears throat> um, and in general, we work to improve farm animal welfare by um, these three kind of main points. So sharing the reality of intensive farming systems and methods um, with the public raising awareness for consumers um, to help them make more informed choices. Um, secondly, through lobbying governments for changes to the law to try to protect farm animals um, and improve this, the standards that they're living in. Um, and lastly, um, by working with food businesses to continually improve farm standards and um, improve animal welfare policies within their supply chains. Our overarching mission is to end factory farming. So these are probably the images most people think of immediately when we say farm animals. Um, and fish, farmed fish, are so often overlooked. Um, and we farm around 20 species of land animals um, around the world but we actually farm over 200 different species of fish. Um, and this number is increasing all the time. Um, so these days, more than half of the fish that people eat comes from aquaculture. Um, and you can see on the graph there that the blue line representing aquaculture, which aquaculture is just uh, generally farming of fish and other animals in, in water, um, has risen very steeply um, and has overtaken wild fish in production, which in the same sort of time frame has sort of leveled out. Um, so yeah, now we, we eat more fish that comes from farming than we do from the wild. Um, but combining all of those different fish species, uh, we farm up to 167 billion fish for human consumption every year. Um, and for comparison, this is, um, you know, there's around 77 billion birds that we farm um, and around 4 billion mammals. So the number, you know, the number is very significant. Um, and we can only really give an estimated range of, uh, of farmed fish numbers um, as the industry generally reports the production of fish in, in weights and tonnages rather than um, counting the individual animals. But we do need to think of them as individual animals. Um, fish are sentient beings, um, which means they can they can feel things, they can um, experience emotions and experience you know experience the life and the environment around them. Um, and they can and there's strong evidence from from science to show that this is the case. So research shows that fish are complex animals. Um, they live complex lives and they have impressive cognitive and intelligent abilities. Um, they form social relationships and they can cooperate um, and they can learn and remember things um, for a lot longer than the three seconds that sort of in, in our society people tend to think um, goldfish with the three second memory but um, this is not true at all. Um, 
fish can remember things and studies have shown that they can remember things after many months or even years. Um, and also importantly, they have the ability to feel pain and suffer, which means that um, when we're farming these animals, we have a duty to protect their welfare. Um, and I've just included uh, the link to our um, briefing on fish sentience, and this goes into in a lot more detail than I've given today. Um, all of the science behind the, um, you know, the evidence for sentience in fish. Um, <clears throat> so in the UK, several species of fish are farmed, um, but salmon aquaculture is the biggest industry. And Atlantic salmon um, live in both freshwater and seawater at different points in their life cycle. Um, so in the wild, they live generally off the coast of the northern Atlantic Ocean and, and the bordering rivers. Um, and they begin life in the up, upper course of rivers where they live for between one and four years. And then they extend their home range as they grow through each of their life stages. Um, so they are carnivorous animals and they eat um, invertebrates, insects and smaller fish. Um, and eventually they do swim out to sea. So this is after a process which is called smultification, um, which is various physiological changes which allows the fish to adapt to living in seawater instead of freshwater. So adult salmon will live in the sea for around three years um, and they can travel around 15 to 13 kilometers every day. So really long distances. Um, and they, uh, eventually they make the journey back to the, to the rivers where they began. Um, so they find their way back to the individual river where they themselves um, hatched. <coughs> um, and Atlantic salmon are well known for their agility and their sort of persistence in getting upstream, which is really challenging with you know, various obstacles in the way. Um, and they can leap from deep water about three meters in the air, which I think is just amazing um, to get up over waterfalls and other obstacles. <coughs> um, exhausted, they'll be exhausted by this journey when they finally um, spawn. So most, most adults will die um, after this whole long journey, um, but some will actually um, survive and be able to make the whole trip out to sea um, and back again multiple times. So in a Scottish salmon farm, life is quite different. Um, again, life starts from eggs in freshwater, but this is in hatcheries. Um, and once the fish hatch, they spend the first year of life growing in freshwater tanks. Um, and when they reach the smolt stage, so obviously when they're ready to be um, moved to seawater, um, they, they transferred, transferred to um, cages around the coast and in locks, um, where they stay for up to two years before they are, um, before they're slaughtered for um, human consumption. So Scotland is the third largest producer of farmed salmon worldwide. Um, and this is behind just Norway and Chile. Um, and in 2019, Scotland produced over 203,000 tons of salmon, which um, is around, which is over 38 million fish. Um, and it, salmon is the biggest food export product for Scotland. Um, and it's sent to over 50 countries around the world. Um, and the industry has plans to increase and produce as much as 350,000 tons. Um, by 2030, and this will be roughly 65 million fish, um, which is sort of, to put that into perspective, it's the, you know, the whole UK population. Um, so why is Compassion and other organisations calling for a moratorium, so a halt on any expand, expansion of the industry? Um, Unfortunately, this, this billion pound industry has some really big animal welfare and environmental costs. So we sent a team of undercover investigators to the west coast of Scotland, the Isle of Skye and the Shetland Islands to film some of the 
welfare issues faced by farm salmon. Um, this investigation was conducted just last year, so in the winter. Um, and the team visited 22 farms. Um, that, that they were covering each of the top five in terms of uh, the production amount um, companies who together produce over 96% of the, um, the salmon produced in 2019. Um, <clears throat> so they filmed overwater footage um, and visited 22 sites, as I said. Um, and we also had footage back from six of those, which was underwater footage, where we could really see what was happening with the fish. <clears throat> um, yeah, so the aim was for this underwater footage to, to, to at least visit one farm from each of the main companies. Um, so we could really see what was happening uh, in examples from across the industry. <clears throat> um, and footage from this trip was used in our salmon campaign, which we launched last month. And at the same time, we also published um, a report in collaboration with One Kind, um, which describes the key welfare and environmental issues in the industry. Um, so I'll summarize some of those issues next. Um, I won't go through all of them because it's a fairly long report, but um, I'll cover some key issues. So first, a few pictures from our investigation. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so the investigation team found examples of parasite infestation. So um, you can see in the photo around the sort of head of the fish, these uh, brown attachments, this is sea lice. Um, and yeah, we saw uh, fish with quite a, quite a high number of sea lice um, attached to them. There were some, <clears throat> there were some fish that had just quite big chunks of flesh mis missing, um, and yeah, it does not look very nice. Um, we even saw some that had eyes missing, um, <clears throat> and they were fish with abrasions, deformities, and fin erosion. Um, and we also saw some examples of poor water quality and a lot of dead fish. Um, <clears throat> so I have not included any videos of the, um, the footage because I was worried about the um, buffering, you know, playing in the webinar, but for videos and to see more of the footage, um, you can just go to our website um, and see those there. So we were focused on the seawater stage for our investigation and, and report. Um, and as I mentioned before, this is when the, the fish or the smolts are moved into the sea cages, um, which are around, they're, they're really big cages. They're around 38 meters across um, and around 15 meters deep, typically. Um, and there's no enrichment specifically added to these um, pens usually. So it, it's sort of a, a cage suspended in the water and that's it. Um, the stopping density of, so the number of fish in, in the area um, on many of the farms is um, a maximum of 17 kilos per meter cubed. Um, so the number of fish in a meter cubed would obviously depend on the size of the fish at the time. Um, and for example, when they were around three kilos, there would be five or six fish in that area, or if they were um, closer to the slaughter weight around five kilos, there would be three fish in a cubic meter, just to give an idea. <clears throat> and in each cage, there's, there's tens of thousands of fish, and at each farm there are uh, multiple pens, so there are hundreds of thousands of fish at, at each of these sites. And during this life stage in the wild, obviously salmon will be migrating out to sea, um, swimming many kilometers, but farmed salmon can't swim any further than the cage walls. So the conditions on salmon farms create sort of ideal environments for disease and parasites to spread. Um, <clears throat> so there's a lot of salmon, as I said, crowded in these cages um, and 
the water quality is often poor and they do face regular handling and stressful procedures. Um, <clears throat> this also involves contact with abrasive surfaces and cage equipment, um, and uh, which can cause gill damage, injuries and open wounds, um, which also increase the likelihood of infection or risk of infections. Um, <clears throat> And salmon are at risk of numerous diseases and, um, and parasites, but I will concentrate on the problem of sea lice today, which is um, a real major welfare issue for Scottish salmon, um, both for the farm fish and the, and the salmon that are wild and migrating past the farms. So sea lice are parasites that feed on the skin, blood and the mucus of fish, such as salmon. Um, they leave painful open wounds and ulcerations, and they can lead to uh, many health issues such as anemia, reduced growth, um, re uh, impaired body defences, and risk of secondary infections. Um, and ultimately, they can also kill fish if the um, numbers are high enough. <clears throat> so they do naturally occur in the environment, but obviously at a much lower incidence because the fish are more spread out. Um, these parasites represent a huge economical cost to the industry, which is, which is attempting to find solutions. Um, but despite many years of research and innovation by, by the sector, the problem isn't solved. Um, and it will only get bigger if the industry is allowed to also get bigger. Um, and I think the most concerning thing for me really is that many of the methods that are being used to treat the fish with lice um, to try to get rid of the sea lice are in, um, in themselves extremely damaging to the salmon and can lead to pain, suffering and death of the fish, not just the lice. Um, so the industry does have a host of measures in place to try to prevent and treat fish with sea lice, but unfortunately um, none of the treatments are fully effective. Um, and some of them are bad for the environment or the fish or, or both. So chemicals can be used to treat sea lice infections, uh, infestations. Um, <clears throat> so for example, hydrogen peroxide, which is a type of bleach is, com is commonly used to treat salmon. Um, and this involves crowding salmon together in a tarpaulin or pumping them up into, into a boat um, and bathing them in, the, in this chemical irritant. Um, so it can affect the gills of salmon, cause lesions, um, and is known to lower stress, um, to lower immunity, sorry, <laughs> and increase stress levels. Um, it's also been uh, seen to result in mass mortalities, um, so it can, yeah, it can cause the fish themselves to die. Um, and after hydrogen peroxide treatment, salmon are usually lethargic and show respiratory distress. Um, and yeah, in some cases, a lot of the fish will die. <clears throat> so next we have some mechanical treatment methods, such as the thermolyser and the hydrolyser. Um, so you can see an example in this video um, where it involves crowding salmon into a small area. So you can see all of the fish are sort of near the surface. They're all packed closely together. And um, this is very stressful for the fish. Um, and then they're pumped up uh, with via these pipes into the boat and in, go through the treatment machine and then they, after the treatment they're pumped back out into the cage. Um, so thermolysis specifically, they target the sea lice by exposing, exposing the salmon and the sea lice to a sudden increase in temperature. Um, so the fish are pumped into water that is as high as sort of 34, 38 to 38 degrees Celsius, um, which is you know, done to cause the sea lice to drop off the fish. Um, but the salmon themselves are also very sensitive to this kind of temperature change. Um, so obviously living in the sea, they're normally living in much colder water um, around 11 to 14 degrees Celsius and isn't is sort of ideal temperature for them. 
Um, <clears throat> And we know that um, even, a, even a temperature increase to over 16 degrees can cause stress and reduce feeding and um, slow the growth of um, salmon. So the thermal isotemperatures are much, much too high. Um, they, co they cause tissue damage, especially to the gills, but also to the eyes and um, the brain. And unsurprisingly, this has been shown to be painful for salmon um, and it causes a sort of panic reaction and try to, uh, you know, they try to move away from the, um, the water, um, which can lead to further damage to the fish. And hydrolysers are, um, they use basically freshwater jets of fresh water to physically remove the sea lice from the surface of the salmon. Um, <clears throat> but this can also cause physical damage to the fish, such as scale loss. Um, and again, it, it's the same process of um, the fish being pumped up and the whole stress, stress around that, um, the crowding and the pumping and moving them and, you know, the whole situation. Um, and again, both of these, um, both of these procedures, there's examples from public data from the Fish Health Inspectorate where um, the use of these machines has killed thousands of fish. <clears throat> so one method that doesn't necessarily kill loads of salmon um, is the use of cleaner fish. Um, these fish are lump fish, and wrasse species um, that are put into cages with salmon to remove lice by eating it from their skin, um, which on the surface might sound like quite a nice idea, um, but introducing a new species of fish into the system brings with it, you know, they bring with it their own welfare issues. Um, <clears throat> so in the wild, so this is a photo, the top is a lump fish and the bottom is a, a wrasse. Um, in the wild, they live different lives to each other and to salmon. So wrasse like the shelter of reefs and they take cover under rocks, um, while lumpfish generally spend time close to the seafloor. Um, and they do all have different biology, different life history and welfare needs. Um, so, <clears throat> but they're all obviously living in the same environment. Um, and welfare issues faced by cleaner fish in salmon farms um, include starvation and competition for food, um, the lack of suitable habitat, such as shelter and places to rest. Um, they can be exposed to aggressive interactions between other fish, um, unsuitable temperatures, and again, disease risk. And they can also, um, they can also have sea lice attached to themselves as well. <clears throat> So Scottish farms are not sort of legally required to report or publish how many cleaner fish they're using um, and where exactly they come from or how they die during production. Um, so there isn't data that I find publicly available at the moment that shows um, how, many, how many of these fish die or survive during this process. Um, but it does appear that cleaner fish mortalities in commercial cages is, is very high. Um, so I, I've found some figures from Norway, which um, sort of suggest this. So <clears throat> Stranden estimated that between 20 and 60% of cleaner fish die before the end of um, the salmon production cycle. Um, according to Nilsson et al, Mortalities range from 18 to 48 percent, with individual farms um, observing up to 100 percent mortality. Um, and Bui et al. reported rates higher than 65 percent. Um, and yeah, and, and also a more recent industry survey reported mortalities of 42 percent. Um, so yeah, they they do have welfare issues, and they do. Um, they are dying prematurely in these in these farms. Um, we will, we, even though we don't know exactly how how much of that is, um, you know, what those rates are in Scotland. <clears throat> but um, 
even those that survive throughout the salmon production cycle, they're not, they're usually not reused for the next salmon cycle. Um, so all of them will, will die during this process. So they are sort of sacrificed for the salmon production. So the next thing I want to talk about, which I think is the, is the most shocking part of the story for me, and that is the number of, of salmon that die during the production cycle. So this graph is made from data reported by the industry and um, published by the government. Um, and you can see that from um, 2000 to 2017, there's a, there's a sort of similar trend with roughly 25% of salmon, which um, you can see with the dark blue bar, um, dying during the production cycle. <clears throat> so yeah, a, around one in four salmon will die. Um, and that's obviously a huge loss of sentient animals. It's around 10 million salmon every year. Um, and this doesn't even account for the fish that die in the freshwater stage, so before they get into the sea cages. So that number would, is actually higher. <clears throat> um, so I'm now going to move on to talk about some of the environmental impacts. Um, so first of all, we have the waste that is entering the marine environment. So obviously, as salmon farms are cages suspended in the sea, um, they're obviously directly releasing waste just into the environment. Um, so this is mainly uneaten food and feces from the fish, which sinks down um, and accumulates on the seabed. Although there will be some dispersal depending on the currents. Um, and it's estimated that around that, that all of the Scottish salmon farms produce around the same amount of waste as half of the human population. So it's, it's quite a lot. Um, and the waste can damage or can change the composition of the, the seabed um, and also the chemistry of the sediment there. Um, so it's partly by depriving the area of oxygen. Um, and although organic waste is obviously a naturally occurring um, thing in marine environments, um, the levels of waste created by salmon farms is, is much higher than what would be there naturally. Um, <clears throat> and it also contains chemicals and medicines and everything that's being used in the farming process as well. Um, and many of the chemicals, insecticides, for example, used to um, get rid of sea lice. They're also, they're also toxic for, for fish, crustaceans, and other marine life. Um, so yeah, that's also going into the environment. <clears throat> um, there's also direct impacts on wild animals in the Scottish um, marine environment. So the salmon industry has in the past been allowed to shoot seals that are trying to predate predate on the salmon in the farms um, used with licenses. They've had um, the ability to shoot some of the seals. Um, but if, thankfully in June last year, the, the Scottish government did vote to ban the shooting of seals on farms. Um, and this move was made to prevent the um, United States banning imports from Scotland, um, which they were suggesting was they would do based um, because they breached US regulations that they had in place to protect the marine mammals in the wild. Um, so yeah, that's how it came about. Um, acoustic deterrent devices, so ADDs, and they're another way of deterring seals and sea lions from salmon farms. Um, and they are devices that emit high frequency sounds. Um, and they are used by quite a lot of the industry, so over 140 salmon farms. Um, so they're a widespread source of underwater noise on, on Scotland's coast. Um, and cetaceans, so, um, you know, dolphins, whales, porpoises, um, they're a very vocal group of animals that do rely on sound. Um, so noise from ADDs has potential to impact their ability to echolocate and, and feed, um, to communicate and locate mates. Um, 
<clears throat> it can also cause stress and exclude them from areas of the ha habitat that they would normally like to be in and would feed in. Um, and it may even temporarily or permanently damage their hearing, um, which would be devastating for these animals. So farming huge numbers of animals in cages in the sea means that, um, you know, in this environment, escapes do happen. Um, so between 2017 and 2019, over 110,000 salmon escaped from Scottish farms. Um, and the main causes for these escapes was recorded as equipment damage from weather or predation um, and human error. Um, and escaped salmon pose a threat to wild populations, um, partly because, uh, and even with the fish while they're in the farms, there is a um, potential for transmission of diseases and parasites to the wild fish that are in the area. <clears throat> and also with salmon that have escaped and they're in the wild environment, um, they could breed interbreed with the wild salmon, <clears throat> which um, can be damaging to the wild population because farm salmon may have like lower fitness unless they've got less genetic variation compared with the wild ones, um, which could you know, impact the fitness of the whole population. Um, and over the last decade, the use of cleaner fish has become more and more popular. Um, millions of fish, cleaner fish are now used. <clears throat> um, so wrasse species are generally caught from the wild and lump fish are now farmed specifically for salmon farming. Um, so wrasse are primarily caught in Scotland and the southwest of England. Um, this puts pressure on wild stocks, big removals of these fish that have suddenly taken place in the last sort of decade. Um, these fish generally have long lifespans and are territorial um, with small home ranges. Um, their behavior is also temperature dependent um, and with it, with it being less active in the winter. Um, so these sorts of things coupled with the lack of data on the health of wild populations mean that they are at risk of overexploitation. <clears throat> um, so now I just want to touch upon the impacts on wild fish. So as I mentioned earlier, over half of the fish people eat does now come from fish farming, um, but there is still pressure on wild fish populations in producing these fish. So in the wild salmon are carnivores, <clears throat> they eat a variety of marine um, animals and crustaceans, fish, everything. Um, so farming carnivorous species such as salmon involves feeding them on a diet that also contains wild fish. So huge numbers of wild fish are caught globally um, to be ground down into fish meal and oil, <clears throat> which is um, you know, a key ingredient in many, in many diets of fish and um, including farm salmon. Um, so globally between half and one trillion fish are caught from the wild to be reduced to fish meal and oil. Um, and there's no protection for the welfare of these fish who suffer you know, greatly during the capture and the death of the fish, because um, when they're brought onto the boats, they, they're not killed in any humane way. They're usually just left to suffocate. And the, the fish used generally for fish meal and oil are forage fish. So they're very they're small um, fish species and they play a really important role in the marine uh, food webs because they sort of they're at the the lower part of the food chain um, that's you know taking uh, energy from pl plankton so plant taking the plant energy and converting it into um, sort of flesh that then larger predatory fish and marine mammals and seabirds will, will eat um, so they're a really important step in this um, in the marine environment um, so obviously taking huge amounts out of the sea to use to feed to farmed animals on land um, and in aquaculture um, is putting huge pressure on wild 
um, marine life. And forage fish species also contribute directly to food security in many countries where they, where they are actually eaten by people. Um, but yeah, so now this is in competition with fish meal production, fish oil production. <clears throat> so according to calculations by feedback, um, the Scottish industry uses around 460,000 tonnes of wild fish every year to feed salmon, um, which is roughly equivalent to the amount of wild caught fish purchased by the entire UK population. So salmon are eating as much fish as everyone in the UK. <laughs> um, and approximately 90% of the wild caught fish um, used for fish meal and oil are food grade, which means they could otherwise be eaten directly by humans. So feeding them to farmed fish such as salmon is a, is a sustainability issue um, because calories are being lost with every step in the food chain. Um, and this seems even more wasteful when we know that one in four of the salmon will die before they even reach um, market weight or before they're even um, you know, killed for human consumption. So it really is wasteful. Um, so yeah, I've covered a lot of topics today. There were some areas that I did not have time to cover. So please take a look at the full report um, on our website. Um, so just to sum up and end the talk, um, talking about our campaign action. So we are, as I said, calling for a halt to any expansion on the industry. Um, and we're collecting signatures on our open letter to the government. Um, so please go to this link if you would like to add your signature. Um, and that's it from me. So thank you all for listening and thank you, Kirsty and OneKind, for having us on the webinar today and yeah, inviting us to join. <laughs>